this is it guys, my 50th video. Now ordinarily I wouldn't be making a big deal about it, but considering the game we're reviewing, the fact that I'm a huge proponent of the Arkham series, the game's critical reception, and this video's serious length, means you gotta know this is gonna be one hell of an interesting video. So without any further ado, I present my review of Batman Arkham Origins. I've loved the Arkham series so far. Arkham City is one of my favorite games of all time, but then again, Arkham Asylum is in many ways better than Arkham City. If you haven't seen it yet, I suggest you go watch my Everything Arkham City Did Wrong video before watching this. It's not crucial, but you'll be able to understand some of my praises and criticisms of Arkham Origins better. Don't worry, it's only 19 minutes long. So Batman Arkham City was announced only a few months after Arkham Asylum's success, and then the following year, it was announced to a huge volley of hype that lasted throughout the entire year leading up to Arkham City's release. Why am I bringing this up? Because things were a bit different this time around. A third Arkham game was officially announced in a fiscal report for Warner Brothers. Yep, no flashy trailer or proud announcement. It was just offhandedly mentioned that the third Arkham game is coming out later this year, so we can expect to make some money off that. Well, doesn't that just bode well? Then the title and premise of the game were officially announced. Arkham Origins was to be released in October of that year. It would be a prequel that would portray a lot of crucial details towards the overall Arkham storyline. And the thing that seemed to catch everyone's attention was, well, that Rocksteady would not be in charge of the game. And in other news, Ben Affleck will be playing Batman. Yeah, you know that developmental team that created this entire series and took the Batman game library from mediocrity to near perfection? Well, they're absent here. Admittedly, this probably means that they're getting a jumpstart on their next Arkham game, which can only be good news. But still, the fact that Rocksteady was being replaced by the brand new Warner Brothers Montreal was not the most reassuring of news. Oh, so they were the ones who ported Arkham City to the Wii U, huh? Splendid news! I can copy and paste code as well. Maybe Nintendo will let me make their next Zelda game. The initial news we were getting was not very reassuring. The main villains thus far seem to be Black Mask and Deathstroke. What? Is there anything new with the gameplay? But as the months passed, things began to look up a bit. The core gameplay looked on par with the Rocksteady games, and it looked like they were going to try and put a greater emphasis on detective work, which is a great idea. I wasn't too enthused by the new scoring system they were adding, and the training area seemed pointless, and I had no idea what to think of the multiplayer. But honestly, the more I followed the game, the better it was looking. It seemed to me that this was the best possible thing that could have happened to the franchise. Perhaps Rocksteady was getting as close to perfection as they possibly could all by themselves, so maybe some fresh eyes were needed to add what they could to the franchise. And then the review scores. Well, a bit of a kick in the nuts for sure, but I still bought the game anyway. In fact, Arkham Origins holds the prestige of being the first game I ever spent a paycheck on. Good job, I guess. So with that ridiculously long backstory out of the way, let's really examine this game. Is it a worthwhile successor, or is it a downgrade? And even if it is a downgrade, is it still worth your money? Well, let's start with the story. Arkham Origins isn't technically a Batman origin story, as it starts around two years after Bruce begins being the Dark Knight, but it's basically got all the elements of an origin story. People are unsure of if he exists, Gordon is distrustful of Batman, Alfred disapproves of Bruce's actions, the police force is corrupt, and Batman meets a very special someone this Christmas Eve. Oh yeah, the game takes place on Christmas Eve. It actually makes for the occasional neat art design, and Joker's Carol of the Bells theme was a terrific choice. Anyway, the story begins with a breakout from Blackgate Prison. Batman flies down there to see that Black Mask is making some changes in Gotham, killing the corrupt Commissioner Loeb. Batman runs into and defeats Killer Croc, who warns him that eight assassins are gunning for him tonight. 
apparently Black Mask has offered $50 million to whoever can kill Batman. So the night begins. Batman has to track down Black Mask and find out what the heck's going on whilst fending off the assassins. The best way I can describe this plot would be... It friggin' reeks of wasted potential. I've talked about how Arkham City tried to have two story arcs in it. Joker and Hugo Strange both tried to take the spotlight. And while Joker was able to get his story arc across, Strange really didn't pull it off. Well, here there's kind of four plot threads, in addition to the eight assassins. In the first half of the game, we track down both Penguin and Black Mask. Neither of them are particularly interesting, and neither of them are relevant after the halfway mark, leading to a rather pathetic payoff on both of them. Hell, unless you do the side missions, neither of them can get captured. You reach them, then both times an assassin nabs you and lets them escape. Then, for the second half of the game, we have Joker and Bane. I gotta say, I was surprised by how much screen time Bane gets considering he's one of the eight underplayed assassins. He's actually really important to the plot, and I'll give credit where credit's due. They make a much smarter Bane who gets in a really jarring plot twist. I like him, but I like the Joker better. He's got a new voice actor, Troy Baker, and he does a really good job. I do hope Hamill comes back for the next current Arkham game, but I'd also love to hear more of Baker's Joker. What screen time he gets is quite good, but I don't think he gets nearly enough screen time. This is why I'm actually irritated by the first half of the game. Penguin isn't as interesting here as he was in Arkham City, and while Black Mask was marketed as the big villain for this game, he ultimately feels like a huge waste of time. And since there's no real payoff with either of them, it makes me question why they take up such a huge part of the game. They take time away from the interesting villains, and the interesting villains are both fighting for space with each other. It ultimately makes everything feel rushed, everything feel underdeveloped. Even Brandon, this corrupt SWAT officer trying to take Black Mask's bounty by killing Batman, gets a really weak payoff. And in between all this, the assassins. With the exception of Bane, they are underdeveloped, come out of nowhere, and just feel shoehorned in. Even Deathstroke, with all the marketing he got, gets one quick boss fight and that's it. I was hoping he'd be like Ocelot in Metal Gear Solid 3, constantly popping up and growing a bigger and bigger respect for you. Nope. He's sadly pointless. Hell, both Lady Shiva and Deadshot are side missions. SIDE MISSIONS! If that doesn't take the narrative urgency out of a situation, I don't know what does. The story itself is okay. The Joker's very entertaining for what little screen time he gets, and Bane's decently interesting. Batman and Gordon go from despising each other to forming a partnership, but they both almost feel like petulant little brats than strong independent figures distrustful of each other. Alfred has a confrontational scene that comes out of nowhere. This plot is just a trite mess of cliches. Do you want to see Oracle's origin story? Wait. Why do you do what you do? Because I made a promise. That's about it. I'll admit it has a few great moments, especially with the Joker, but is ultimately a waste of time. In fact, there we go, that's the other big problem I have. This was all a waste of time. Referring back to Metal Gear Solid 3, by that incredible ending, we understood why Big Boss established Outer Heaven, and we are even more interested in Ocelot. The point is, it related back to both previous games, and then Metal Gear Solid 4 tied it in even better. I know Arkham 4 might touch on some of the stuff here, but I really feel like we've learned nothing new. There are some minor after credit hints, but they really do nothing to get me hyped up for the next game. Arkham City did a far better job at that, even if Harley's Revenge reneged some of it. I can understand that this doesn't have to really tie into the previous Arkham games, and that it can be judged purely as a standalone Batman origin story. Alright, fine. As a standalone story, it has even less worthwhile consequence than Arkham Asylum, and has worse pacing than Arkham City. It's like it takes the bad parts of both games and amplifies them. The result is an okay story that probably won't leave much of an impact. This game has many times been called Arkham City 1.5, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I'm of the mindset that even minor improvements can still be considered improvements, so as long as the 1.5 isn't axing any fundamentals that the originals nailed, like pacing and creativity, 
the 1.5 can still be a wholly enjoyable product, perhaps even being superior to its predecessor. Uh, to me, that's what happened with Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. I liked it better than Assassin's Creed 2. So let's see if Arkham Origins can overcome its terrible story to attain the heights of its predecessors. The first thing I noticed of all things was the switching of detective mode and gadgets. In the previous games, L1 was to use a gadget and L2 was detective mode. In Arkham Origins, some dumbass decided it would be a great idea to switch them. Why? What called for that? So there are the irritations that I get whenever I mean to throw on detective mode and instead I toss a battering, or when I mean to detonate explosive gel but instead I spray it again in the exact same spot, or I lose my con because I, I meant to throw a quick fire gadget and now that I'm used to this switch around I'd have to reacclimate back to Arkham City and no you can't change this bullcrap in the options I checked three times so I can really only pick one of these to be my go-to Batman game that I pick up whenever I feel like messing around in the challenge mode that's a bit of an arrogant thing to do trying to overwrite the previous games but who knows maybe the gameplay is a substantial improvement Let's start with combat. I've gone on record numerous times saying that the Arkham series combat is really great. It's fast paced and remarkably fluid. The gameplay at E3 seemed to show that the combat was competently recreated. And I have to agree. It's a little weird that the sound effects are different, but hey, you know what? It's very polished. The system is still able to tell what enemy I'm intending to punch next, even in big crowds. New to the game are these martial artists who can counter your attacks, and I really don't like them, but they're only used a handful of times in the whole game. But otherwise, I really got into the combat just like old times, until the enemies started getting too aggressive. You gotta understand, I have played the hell out of Arkham Asylum, and especially Arkham City. I know the timing on those counters to the friggin' nanosecond, and I am programmed as such. So I know that I should be able to get in another attack before countering, or that I can just attack the person putting up the countersign. But here, these enemies were clearly made more aggressive. I was shocked to find myself getting my ass handed to me on a number of times. I actually died in some regular fistfights. That never happened in the previous two games. Some will probably welcome this new challenge, and perhaps it subtly conveys the young Dark Knight's lack of experience. But to me, it completely dumps on the combat system I knew like the back of my hand. Suddenly I can't sneak in that last second attack even though I know I should be able to. And I definitely remember the ultra stun negating any attacks enemies would throw in Arkham City if you got to the third circle. Not the case here. To me it feels like Arkham Origins is trying to overwrite Arkham City by doing this. Some may say it is an improvement. Cool. I don't care. I'm so used to the system placed in Arkham City and so baffled as to why the developers would make this change that I am nothing but annoyed with the more aggressive enemies. I still like the combat. And there are these new shot gloves that are pretty neat. They're very satisfying, even if they take away some of the exhilarating strategic challenge. But if I had to choose between the two styles, I'd take Arkham City's fighting any day. Predator Mode well, like the combat, there aren't really many new additions in contrast to Arkham City, which heavily expanded on the previous game's feature set. The only new things are a couple of gadgets. Sort of. For the most part, the gadgets are the same. You even get glue grenades to replace the ice grenades of Arkham City. Then there's the new Concussion Detonator, which is a gigantic downgrade from the electric gun it replaces. The Concussion Detonator has no purpose in puzzles, and instead of being an instantaneous shot to spaz an enemy out, it's a grenade that takes several seconds to activate, and that's not really fitting in the fast-paced combat. And hell, in stealth it's even more pointless. I've barely used this gadget at all. Then there's the new Remote Claw, which the developers were really proud of. It was in all the demonstrations and sees liberal use throughout the campaign. It can be used to extend wires across vertical shafts and works as a line launcher substitute. But since its use is contextual, I think it's actually kind of a downgrade to the line launcher. I'm probably the minority here, but I love using the line launcher in unorthodox situations to traverse or even escape. I'm sure most don't see it that way, but I got a lot of use out of that line launcher in the first two games, so I found this to be kind of a letdown. Okay, I've been digressing back to the Predator section. They are still quite fun, but I do feel like they were hit with a downgrade as well. I wasn't having nearly as much fun with them as I was in City, and for a while I couldn't figure out why. Everything seemed intact. And then I figured it out. 
it's the level design. It's significantly blander. I think Rocksteady understood how to make their levels cater to their stealth mechanics better than Warner Brothers Montreal does. The big thing is that the stealth levels in this game are just so massive. I know that sounds like it'd be a good thing, heck, usually it would be, but in this case, it spaces out all of the interesting takedown opportunities of the levels to the point where you will probably never use them during the campaign. But they had to make the levels bigger because they decide to make the groups of enemies you face in these sections bigger, which was ultimately a poor decision that leads to mostly just silent takedowns and a lack of variety. It's fun, but, again, quite the downgrade. The open world that you'll be romping around in this game is now the entirety of Gotham City, something everyone has been clamoring for since the first Arkham game. Everyone except me, that is. I knew that if this was done, we wouldn't have any citizens to interact with, because honestly, that just can't work. So the city would feel lifeless, and if this was just a regular city, things would get pretty boring. And I was absolutely right. Truth be told, I find myself actually getting pretty exasperated when people complain that the curfew on Gotham City in this game is far-fetched. Yeah, like Arkham City wasn't? Shut up, you're missing the point. In this case, Gotham is just lifeless, and without all the super criminals giving flavor to the areas like with Asylum and especially City, Gotham City is a rather dull and unmemorable location with far less atmosphere. I mean, it's there, but... Not as much. Arkham City's sandbox was never rivaling Grand Theft Auto in terms of scope, but that level of focus led to a far more memorably designed environment that I honestly wouldn't even need a map to navigate around at this point. Arkham Origins takes that away, making the environment just as bleak as in many other sandbox games, but without giving the player any interesting things to do or even civilians to murder. I mean, even the section of Gotham that was ported over from Arkham City has lost all character. With the fun traversal and a convenient fast travel system, it's not bad, but, again, it is a serious downgrade. Downgrade is the best way for me to describe almost every facet of this experience. The combat has been downgraded, the stealth has been downgraded, the story has been downgraded, the sandbox has been downgraded, even more minute stuff has been downgraded. Remember the physical challenges in Arkham City? Well now they are four separate challenge towers, limiting your options to tackling each challenge one by one. And the worst part is that the worst nightmare track, the Predator track, so it would be the most interesting because of all the opportunities you have for varied takedowns, is way too demanding way too fast. By the third slot, you're told to perform a Predator encounter without being seen. But believe it or not, both being seen and Predator encounter are both pretty vague expressions when you get into practical gameplay. Does being seen mean physically being caught in an opponent's eyesight, or simply performing a loud takedown and alerting everyone to your presence? And do the open world encounters count as predator encounters? Because I swear they sometimes don't, but the game never explains it, which really stinks because they account for more than two-thirds of the goddamn predator gameplay. There's a lot more combat than stealth anyway, which leads me to think that maybe some of these predator challenges should have maybe been commands to do specific takedowns instead of this overbearing bullcrap that almost guarantees that you won't finish this challenge tower on a first or even second playthrough. Another downgrade is the upgrade. Ah ha ha, I get it. Look, the previous games weren't exactly deus ex, but the possible upgrades were at least useful and somewhat conflicting. Here I found myself completely apathetic to the lame upgrade tree. Your pathways are far more limited this time, and your abilities are basically sufficient from the get-go now. Apart from the armor and an admittedly very useful fast silent takedown, I couldn't have cared less about how Batman's abilities progressed, except, annoyingly enough, for the critical strikes, which I swear aren't available until towards the end of the game. The side missions are quite underwhelming this time. Anarchy is just Zazz, but far shorter and less interesting. Black Mask and Penguin are both like Bane, except Bane's side quest was cleverly structured in that you'd come across the Titan containers during the campaign without much sidetracking. That's far from the case here. 
both of the assassin side missions, Deadshot and Lady Shiva, are both disappointingly short, even if Deadshot's boss fight is actually a decent upgrade from the laughable climax in Arkham City. Then there's the Riddler, who is mostly a retread of what's already come, except the incredibly cool torture rooms are replaced with some incredibly pathetic tower puzzles. The Enigma data packs are still very addicting to collect, I will admit, but the repetition in collecting them in the overworld is downright insane. Yeah, there's like 20 data packs hidden in the exact same manner. I think the Riddler interrogations are less fun too, because they are no longer random, and you don't have to strategize about keeping them conscious throughout the entire fight. If you knock them down, they'll stay down and you can interrogate them. I know some might like that, I didn't. And the whole side quest just has no payoff. There's no final encounter with the Riddler at all. You just go back to his hideout and pick up your first Riddler trophy. It's admittedly a pretty neat moment, but also really half-assed. Even the interview tapes aren't as interesting as those in Arkham Asylum, and especially Arkham City. So I guess you could say that the side quests are, indeed, downgrades as well. So, any improvements? Well, the detective work has been expanded, I'll give you that. Now you can reconstruct the crime scene and the events that took place. It still boils down to looking for a red triangle to scan, but it's a neat addition, and I like a greater influence on detective work, so I'm hoping Rocksteady will learn from this. Boss fights are actually really solid. I really like what they did with the Deathstroke fight. This is how you can do one-on-one -on -one fights, Rocksteady. Yeah, okay, it does kind of boil down to wailing away on the guy until you have to participate in a glorified quick time event, but it's actually really exhilarating to nail all the counters in a sequence. Then there's the Mad Hatter. In Arkham City, he was just a very trippy fist fight, but in Arkham Origins, he gets a bit of an overhaul. Now that is what I am talking about. Copperhead's also quite good. You see, this is where I'm down with more aggressive enemies. It overwhelms you quite nicely. It's a rather well done transition from being completely badass to being in way over your head, which are emotions that Batman himself would currently be feeling. And then there's Bane. Let's just say I can see why the writers wanted to include him. He does lead to some pretty intense boss fights. He's a pretty serious threat and very exciting to face. Also, remember in my Everything Arkham City Did Wrong video when I talked about how Killer Croc would make a great stealth boss fight? Well... Well, they completely blew it with Killer Croc being a very lackluster fight to kick off the game with. But Bane's final boss fight was a great example of what I was looking for. It's like the Mr. Freeze fight, except that it is more intense, has fewer easy ways of nabbing Bane, it's much harder to get away from the guy, and it's timed. This boss fight was legitimately scary, and is hands down the best part of the game. For all the anger I've thrown at Warner Bros. Montreal, they should be commended for this boss fight. I also do respect what Warner Brothers Montreal was trying to do with more linear level design. You do spend the vast majority of the campaign inside buildings rather than outside, which is another thing I was really calling for in Arkham City. But I also don't really think they capitalized on this. The game is still mostly combat stealth and a huge increase in traversal puzzles. It's more repetitive than Arkham City really, which is odd because this game makes an effort to include, like I said, traversal puzzles, an area that Arkham City was quite deficient in, so you'd think it would be less repetitive than Arkham City. I can tell that these were meant to be a break between all the confrontations, but it really didn't work. It essentially just boils down to using the remote claw or grappling hook to pass with no real brain power involved. But wait a minute, the last time we saw a lot of traversal was in Arkham Asylum, and there we basically just used the grapnel hook in the back claw, and I had no complaints there, so what's the difference? Well, Arkham Asylum was just drenched in atmosphere, the environments were just enthralling to explore. Here, the level designs and aesthetics are really dull. 
And again, Arkham Asylum had more variety than either of its sequels, and I am so disappointed that Arkham Origins failed to use its more linear nature to change things up. I was so excited when I had to go into the GCPD and Alfred warned me that I needed to avoid confrontations with the corrupt cops. I thought I was going to be able to ghost my way throughout the building. That would have made for a great change up, just like it did in Arkham Asylum. But nope, you do plenty of takedowns and even some full-on fist fights. It's as bland as the rest of the game. Then there's Multiplo. Oh god, ugh. The multiplayer is pathetic. I wasn't really happy to hear that there would be multiplayer in this game. There's gotta be a reason why Rocksteady opted not to do it back in 2011. Well, now we have multiplayer, and I can now understand why it was initially passed over. It's a three-way game, with two teams of three thugs and one team of both Batman and Robin. The thugs shoot it out whilst Batman and Robin do their whole predator shtick. There are two major problems with this setup. First, the matches outright require 8 people because the 3 teams are all so small that losing one player just kills the balance. A team of 4 can still hold their own if forced to be a team of 3, but a team of 3 really can't transition to a team of 2, and that goes double for Batman and Robin. So getting a match is an arduous process that takes forever. The other unavoidable problem is that you only have a 25% chance of playing as a character that you actually want to be. No one wants to be a thug. They all want to be Batman and Robin, so you basically have to suffer 75% of the time to enjoy a little bit of Predator action. Wow, oh wow. And the multiplayer itself just lacks polish. I really didn't play enough to be able to adequately describe why everything feels lackluster, but I can assure you, it's quite lackluster. Being a Predator is nowhere near as smooth in multiplayer as it is in single player, and the third person shooting controls for the thugs leave much to be desired. But hey, it's multiplayer, right? It's optional, so it should have no detrimental effect on the game itself. Hell, I even mocked IGN over this in my Tomb Raider review. And as a result, I have no use for this mode. But at the same time, it's nothing to take away points for IGN. Well, IGN, I sincerely apologize. I was wrong. Because of this game, I have figured out how multiplayer can be detrimental to a video game. It can destroy completionism. Look, I'm not even really what you could call much of a trophy nut. Unless I really love a game, I tend to ignore the trophies. But I love both Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, so I've gone for the Platinums. I have Arkham Cities and I'll have Asylums whenever I get around to beating it on hard mode. It's almost become a tradition at this point. I've gone and beaten the entire challenge mode of Arkham City. It was no small feat, I can assure you. I would have loved to do this again for Arkham Origins, but now there are multiplayer trophies and there is no way in hell I'm getting those. Some of them are obnoxiously specific. So no Platinum. Suddenly the challenge mode seems like a waste of time, its trophy count is diminished, and if the developers don't care about it, why the hell should I? Heck, I don't even want to do New Game Plus, or this new edition called I Am The Night Mode. Basically, it's a one life run. Yeah, apparently if you die once, it's game over. What is this doing here? This is something I would have wanted to see in a survival horror game or something like The Last of Us. It is no worth here, and I could just see myself blowing it at the final boss fight too. But back to the multiplayer's dreadful effect, I spent upwards of 50 hours on 100%ing Arkham City. That was Arkham City's strongest virtue, and now this so-called Arkham City 1.5 has absolutely lost that. And the best part? is that the multiplayer is probably going to be carried over into later installments in the Arkham series because if you don't, well it's a downgrade and most people don't seem to realize how it can be detrimental so why not include it? Rocksteady will probably have to. So in other words, whichever pompous, disillusioned dildo decided that including crappy multiplayer into this game was a good idea has effectively RUINED COMPLETIONISM FOR THIS ENTIRE SERIES HENCEFORTH! So, I don't know if this is obvious, but this game has really infuriated me. But for whatever it's worth, I couldn't have picked a more fitting game for my 50th video. And I say this because, really, it's a perfect example as to why I think many people like myself review games anyway. Reviewing started out as a means to give information to consumers, to help them spend money on quality entertainment. Then people like the Angry Video Game Nerd came out and made reviewing a form of entertainment itself. Then a new form of reviewing came about, 
merging the clinical analyzation of older review editorials with the new reviewer's sole intent to entertain. The result is a group of reviewers who are largely informative rather than comedic, but have the primary goal of entertaining through insight and honesty, and the secondary of goal of actually recommending the product. I say this because I am one of these people. I make reviews to explain my opinion that you guys hopefully find interesting. I'm not usually someone who's looking out for what you guys spend your money on. If that was the primary goal of these types of videos, Johnny wouldn't have made a 50 minute review of Sonic 06. And more relevantly, I would have told you from the get go to just go pick up Arkham Origins. Despite everything I said, this is a new, if very bland and damaging to its series, rendition of Arkham City, one of my favorite games of all time. I easily lost a couple weekends to this game and was even willing to get all the Enigma data packs, even if I did regret it afterwards. I give it my full recommendation for you guys to pick it up and enjoy it, but that's never been what this review was about. I made this video to explain my honest feelings about Arkham Origins and express my concern for the series. Between the escalation of stealth sequences that ultimately detracts from the memorability of the environments, and thus the sequences themselves, to the addition of crappy multiplayer that's probably going to stick around, I fear that Rocksteady has been dug into a bit of a hole. I don't want them to feel compelled to match what was done here. That can only lead to more bloated downgrades that lack incentives for completionism. And that's to say nothing about how much this game thoroughly exasperated me with all of its arrogant and stupid design choices, combined with a lackluster story and horrible disjointed pacing. Judged on its own terms as just any old game on the market, it's pretty good, fairly absorbing, and worth the 60 bucks. But when I judge it as a game in the phenomenal Arkham series, and that's what I've been doing, it's terrible. It's a disgrace to the series that leaves me quite infuriated.